This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to iCanBeast RBT training. This is Dr. Davila. Nice to see you again. In this training, we're going to be talking about measurement. We've talked about measurement in previous presentations, and I'm going to give you some more information about measurement because measurement is so essential in our field. So I really want you to get a really good sense of, you know, how we do data collection. So this is going to be an extra review for that. So once again, just to emphasize the importance of data collection. So data collection allows us to make decisions. It allows us to evaluate progress versus no progress. And in our field, we make database decisions. So having that data allows us to make those decisions. Funding sources require data to continue funding services. So we work with a variety of different funding sources. Um, one thing is for sure consistent across all the funding sources, and that's the fact that they all require a progress report with data um, attached to it so we can be able to do document and uh, demonstrate that our services are being effective with the members that we're serving. So issues with data collection. So sometimes what happens is that data is not being collected on the spot. We sometimes have, you know, behavior technicians or sometimes people, you know, we forget sometimes. And what happens is that you leave the data collection aspect to the end of the session or you delay it right after the program is, um, is conducted. But the problem with that is that you're relying on memory. And if you think about it, memory is very, very, very um I'll explain this to you it's not it's not really good to rely on memory basically because you know there's so many things that transpire so you're not going to be able to really capture objectively and precisely what happened so that's one of the major issues with data collection another one is that data you know may be too com complex or unclear def uh, definitions so when we talk about too complex is the fact that you may have too much data collection too, too many da data collection systems and methods at the same time and it, it happens. It's really important for us to make sure that we emphasize and focus on those data collection systems that you know are really going to allow us to capture those behaviors that we want to keep uh, keep track of. Um, the other one is uh, unclear definitions. Sometimes we have definitions that are too long or too short. So it's really good to have really you know clear and concise definition. We talked about operational definitions in some of our other videos, but for sure that's one of the some of the issues with regards to data collection. So in data collection, we, we talk about measurable dimensions of behavior. So number one is repeatability, which is basically instances of a response class uh, can occur repeatedly through time. So, you know, we can be able to count how many times a certain behavior occurs because it repeats itself. Okay, so it's very, very specifically, once again, back to repeating, being able to count those responses across time. Number two is temporal extent. So it says here, every instance of behavior occurs during some amount of time. So we, you know, for instance, can measure duration how long does that particular tantrum last? Does it last, you know, one second? Does it last, you know, five minutes? Does it last 10 minutes? So it really depends, once again, on the duration. That's why we focus on also something called temporal extent. Then we have something called temporal locus, which is basically every instance of behavior occurs at a certain point in time with respect to other events. So when behavior occurs, it, it can be measured, basically. So there's other stuff that's happening, and we're basically being able to measure that behavior at certain points, you know, with respect to certain types of antecedents, um, you know, certain events or other types of environmental variables that occur while this behavior is there. So the first thing we want to talk about is continuous measurement. Once again, we have reviewed continuous measurement in the past, but I'll, I would like to review this again with you. So the definition for this measurement conducted in a manner such that all instances of the response class or classes of interest are detected during the observation period. So the first one is frequency. And frequency is really, really simple in the sense that you can be able to have a very discrete behavior that you're tracking. You're literally just telling to see if that behavior occurs or not. And here are just some examples of different types of behaviors that we may be able to use frequency with. So it says here ought to be humming, kissing, jumping, flapping, screaming, singing, fighting, stemming, or kicking. Right here, this particular example, you're able to see that they actually gave a total for that particular session. You see that it says, you know, three for stereotypy, and I'm assuming 19 might be for the entire week or it can be the month. So we were able to add that up. Um, and for instance, for, for humming, there were zero instances. And, you know, there you see it. For kissing, there was two instances of kissing, um, you know, circle that, two. And then we have nine instances of kissing, basically, total. So once again, this is very important to kind of see how not only can we be able to have a total for how many behaviors or how many responses we had in that particular day, but we can also be able to track it across an entire period of time. Once again, it can be weeks, it can be months, it can be an entire reporting period, which is what we do when we're working with funding sources. Okay. 
All right, so let's move on back to the pointer. So, um, and we're gonna basically be able to practice. So what, we're, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my timer. It says here for so how many times the instructor raises his hand during a two minute trial. So I'm gonna go ahead and put two minutes on my timer. So hopefully you're not gonna get too bored with this example here. So let's put two minutes. So when I say go, you guys are gonna start, you know, basically uh, recording how many times I'm gonna raise my hand like this. Okay, when I raise my hand like this, just write a tally on a piece of paper or something you have around there. Okay, so I'm gonna start in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Hopefully, I'm not boring you guys with this. It's a really nice day, by the way, outside. Mm -hmm. I like to hum sometimes when I try to like entertain myself. La 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 I like to eat, eat, eat apples and banana. I'm sure you guys, well, some of you guys probably remember that song. I'm not sure if you guys know, but aside from you know, practicing behavior analysis, I also love animations and I like to, you know, sing and like to write and sing music as well. Other chores. All right, so that's my timer there. So hopefully you were able to record how many times I went like this. And don't record this one here, by the way, because the timer was already done so um i counted four instances uh i you know i was counting with my other hand inside so that's right there's an example basically what you're going to be doing so in this case i told you hey you know count each time i go like this right and that's what's going to happen when you're working in the field your supervisor is going to give you very specific instructions going to give you a definition and is going to tell you what to look for and what behaviors to track during that particular time and here's just basically uh, another type of data collection that we've talked uh, about in the past. This one's called duration. In this particular example here, and I'm sorry it's not too clear here, but we have basically the person's name, the behavior, so it's John Person, uh, the server is Tina, the date of the observation, and basically a total duration uh, across the entire time. So here we had different behaviors, one, two, three, four, five behaviors and basically how many episodes we had for each behavior and how long, this is really the main thing that we wanna focus on here, seconds, how long uh, did each of these behaviors last? So by looking at this information here, you're able to see that this one here, 152 seconds, behavior B was the highest one, right? So we had the, uh, the, the longest, I'm sorry, the longest uh, uh, in duration. Um, and that's relevant to the percentage of observation time. So they say here that you know this behavior was observed 43.9% of the time in which the observation occurred. The lowest one here was this one, which occurred 143 um, you know, seconds, and it was 41.3% uh, of the time, okay? So this information is really important because duration allows us to measure how long a behavior lasts. Like another thing to look at too is the fact that what's really interesting here, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure they did this on purpose is that you know, they had that the highest frequency of behavior was this behavior that had the longest duration, you know? And that sometimes happens. You have behaviors that, that happen uh, very frequently, but they're very short in duration, okay? And something to examine there is very specifically like, you know, are these very short in duration, you know, episodes really causing significant 
uh, damage or, or you know, are they a severity really significant enough for us to be able to look into them and have a very specialized treatment? So kind of things to look at, the dimensions that we want to prioritize, and it's up to your supervisors to figure that out. But I just wanted to put that out there that we do look at different, um, you know, types of measurement systems at once. Okay. All right. So moving on to the next thing. So uh, you're going to count how many seconds instructor can hold this for her breath. Wow, what a, what a great example here. So what you're going to do is basically that, you know, when I say go, when I say go, and I, I don't think it's going to be very long, to be honest with you. When I say go, um, you know, you're going to start, you know, basically recording when, I, when I'm like this. Okay, so when I, when I say go, so I'm going to count down, okay? So, and when I say stop, that's at the point where, where I stop, you know, the, basically holding my breath, okay? So ready? Five, four, three, two, one, go. Stop. Ooh, all right. So in my stopwatch, I was able to record 31.71 um, seconds. Okay, so that's how long I was able to hold my breath. So I tried actually, so not very long. I'm sure some of you guys can probably hold it longer, but that's basically what duration is. You're basically seeing how long a behavior is occurring, okay? So um, another thing we look at is that, you know, we try to calculate rates. Calculation of rate is really important because sometimes we have observation times that are different. Um, sometimes we have a two hour session. Sometimes we have a, a two and a half hour session. Sometimes we have a three hour session. So it varies. And if you're just keeping track of frequency itself, by itself, frequency does not account for observation time. So that's why rate is so essential. So in order to calculate rate, it's not too complicated. All we're basically doing is we're just gonna put the number of instances or frequency count here at the top. And you're just going to divide it however long your observation time uh, was, okay? And we're going to show some examples now, so you guys can get some practice there. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So let's start with the first example. So the first example has 14 instances of punching in two hours. So here the focal point, once again, is going to be, you know, this, the how many times, and how long the observation time. So are you going to be doing here, and if you have a calculator, you can do this really quickly. Not that great in math, believe me. So you're going to basically divide 14 by 2. And I think this should be 7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 7. So I just wanted to confirm. All right, awesome. And then the next one uh, here, we have 10 instances of screening in one hour. And that's really simple. You're all going to be doing this 10 by 1. And it should be 10, right? 10 per hour. I forgot to put that in here. So that's 10 per hour. This is at the time writing seven per hour and this is 10 per hour. Okay. And then the next one's going to be uh, four instances of falling to the floor in three hours. So you're going to divide four divided by three. And that's going to give us, let's see here, four divided by three, uh, 1.33. Okay. 1.33. Then the next one, and this should be four here. I don't want to put a three here. It'll be 10. Uh, instance of throwing toys in 10 minutes. And for that, we're going to actually calculate minutes, which that does happen sometimes. You may actually change, you know, this particular dimension to something else. So now that is going to be 10 divided by 10. So that's going to be one instance, one, um, one instance per, uh, per minute. So it's one per minute. Okay. So that's how we calculate, um, you know, rates. Okay, now the cool thing about it, about all of this is that you technically don't need to worry about that anymore as much as before we used to, because now you, uh, your, your devices or, you know, the platforms we use calculate that automatically for us. But nonetheless, it's good to know because in your RBT exam, you might actually be asked that. So it's good to get that already in, in, uh, in, your, in your repertoire. All right, so now we're going to look at something called discontinuous measurement. So this is the type of measurement that's conducted in a manner such that some instances of the response class or classes of interest may not be detected. 
and we use this a lot when be, when behaviors you know are very 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 extensive they happen a lot basically across the data it's so hard to keep a, a, a frequency count it's so hard to have a discrete response sometimes it's very unclear when did it start when did it end so this is when we start using that discontinued measurement we did talk about some of these examples earlier uh, in, another, in other videos so let's look into it so at I can be, you might be using some, something like this, a data sheet that looks like this. It looks a little bit more complicated than what it really is. So basically here, you, you put the student's name. Uh, how long is basically each interval? Usually we do 10 second intervals. Um, you know, how long, um, basically the, the, the definition here, the definition of the behavior you're looking for and the type of response, because there's different types. Remember there's a whole interval, um, you know, there is partial and we have momentary. Okay. And if the behavior occurs, you're going to put a plus. If the behavior is not seen in that particular interval, you're going to put a minus. Okay, so very, very straightforward. All right, but I don't want you to worry too much about, you know, this the data collection part right now yet. Um, what we're going to do is basically, you know, look at the, you know, one of uh, these particular uh, time samples and then practice a little bit. It's not going to be too complicated, okay, I promise you. So the first one is uh, write a plus if instructor waves hand at all during each 10 second interval. Write a minus if instructor does not wave hands during the 10 second interval. So all you're basically going to be doing is that I'm, you're, you're going to set a, uh, a stopwatch. Okay, you're going to have a stopwatch, and basically um, you're going to put basically the a 10 sec uh, for each, each 10 seconds that transpire. So you're going to put 10 second. I mean you're going to put a stopwatch for each 10 seconds that transpire. You're going to record whether within those 10 seconds did I do this. Oh, it says wave hand, so did I do this? Okay, so if I did this during those 10 seconds, you're going to put a plus on. You can use a, a you know some document there with you, or some piece of paper there to record this. So you're going to need a piece of paper. You're going to need a stopwatch. You can use your phone the way I'm using it, and basically you're just going to record whether I do this, whether it happens within those particular 10 seconds. So let's do it really quickly. So I'm going to practice with you guys. Okay, so I'm going to. So I'm gonna start with the one interval, okay? So I'm gonna start the 10 seconds now. Okay, so that right there was an example of one trial, okay? So I did do it. So it, basically in that one, you would put a plus, okay, on your on your form, on your you know piece of paper. Now I'm gonna do another one where I'm not gonna do this, okay? So I'm not gonna do this. Really quickly. So let me show you. So I did not do it. So if I did not do it within those uh, 10 seconds, minus. Okay. So I hope you got that. So if I do do this right here, this waving hands, you put a plus within those 10 seconds. If I don't, you put a minus. Okay. So here we go, let's practice again. So I'm gonna actually set a timer like this. I think this might be better actually for you. So I'm gonna set it up uh, for 10 seconds and then each 10 seconds, um, you're gonna put a plus or minus and then I'm gonna restart it again and then you're gonna put a plus or minus. We're probably gonna do this, you know, maybe four or five times so you guys can get some extra practice, okay? So here we go. All right, that's one trial. Okay, that's a second trial. So record your data. All right, that's the ter third trial. Record your data, plus or minus. All right, and we're gonna end it there. So if you have something where it says, um, you know, that you, that you saw two, so there was actually four trials. So there was four opportunities. I actually wave my hand in two of those 10 second samples. So in this case, I wave my hand, uh, my hands 50% of the time during those particular uh, time samples. Okay, hope that makes sense. So 
don't worry too much about this. I just want you to get the idea, the fact that, you know, these particular types of data collection systems we do use sometimes. And your supervisor will be there to assist you and provide you some more instruction on how to utilize this and how to document that data. So do not stress about it. But nonetheless, you know, hopefully you were able to get a sense of how those particular, this particular data uh, collection system works. Okay, so let's move on to the next, uh, the next slide. So whole time sampling. So whole time sample is a little bit different. In this one, you're gonna write a plus if the instructor remains seated for the entire 10 seconds. That's gonna be a little bit difficult. So hopefully you guys can see me there. So this is me standing up, by the way. So I'm getting out of the chair. This is me sitting down. So I'm you know, here right in front of me. So I'm gonna put the camera a little bit far away from here. So if I am sitting down like this, uh, you know, basically, you know, you're gonna put a plus. So I have to be sitting down for those 10 seconds. If I get up and I don't remain seated for those entire 10 seconds, and I'm literally just doing this, um, then that right there would be a minus, okay? So you're going to only record a plus when I'm sitting like this. And I'm going to tell you, I'm sitting now, okay? And if I go like this, so you guys, in case you can't really see the detail, if I'm saying I'm standing, okay, that'll give you a cue that I'm standing, okay? And then when I go down, I'm going to say I'm sitting, so you guys can see the difference, okay? So let's get started with this example here. So we're gonna give it a try. So I'm gonna give you guys the first, um, you know, the first sample. So here I go. So I'm sitting by the way right now. Okay, so in that example, that will be a plus because I, I was sitting the entire 10 seconds, okay? Okay, so here comes the second one. I'm standing now. Hello. Okay. So in that example, it would be a minus because I actually was standing up. Um, I, I was not uh, seated across the entire 10 seconds. So it says you're right if instructor does not remain seated during the entire 10 seconds. Okay. So we're going to do it now. And you guys are going to now track your data. Um, and I'm gonna actually go ahead and, and track data with you guys too, okay? So, uh, so I can also like, we can compare notes afterwards, okay? All right, so ready, set, go. So I'm sitting now. Okay, record your data. Okay, here comes the second one. I'm standing. Okay, record your data. Okay, I'm sitting now. Okay, record your data. Okay. Here we go again. I'm standing. All right, record your data. So we had four opportunities. So we had four opportunities again. And what I recorded was that I was actually, um, you know, I remained seated across an entire 10 seconds for only two times. So two out of four. So it was again 50% of the time. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next one. So momentary time sampling. So this is another type of partial uh, data collection. So here, you're gonna write a plus if the instructor is humming right at the 10 second interval. You're gonna write a minus if the instructor is not humming right at the 10 second interval. So the focal point here is just specifically when you hear the alarm go off. If I'm humming at that moment, then that means you're gonna put a plus. If I'm not humming at that point, then you're gonna put a minus. What does my hum look like well, or sound like? That's me doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna practice with you guys real quick. So here comes the first trial. So ready, set, go. Mm hmm. And those 10 seconds were up, 
and I was humming there. So if I was humming there right at the 10 second mark when the timer went off, then that right there would be a plus, okay? You will put a plus, okay? Now I'm gonna give you an example where I'm not humming at the 10 second mark. So I got started now with the 10 seconds. All right, so that would be a minus, okay? So basically that's right there. It's momentary time sample for you. Um, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a few more, few trials together so you guys can get some more practice, okay? Here we go. Ready, set, go. Okay, record your data. Okay, here we go, next trial. All right, record your data. That's this. Uh, we're going to start the third trial now. Okay, record your data. We're going to start the last trial now. Okay, all right, so that's it. So we had four opportunities. With my data, I was able to record three out of four opportunities where I was humming right at the 10 second mark. So here, I was humming 75% 75, 75 of the time, okay? So that's how you will record your data. All right. Move on to the next slide now. Permanent product. Permanent product is another really, really important thing to look at. And basically here, we're just basically counting how many things that can be seen in the environment that can account for the behavior that occurred. So for instance, count, it says here, count how many uh, pens the instructor put away uh, in the pen case across a one minute observation, okay? So I actually have here uh, with me, um, um, one of these things here where I can put my, my pen or my markers. So we're gonna actually count how many of them I actually put in here. I'm gonna show you guys specifically so you guys can count it, okay? So let me just mark first, let me get started. Uh, all right, so right now it has zero. Okay, it has zero, it has zero markers or, yeah, it's just markers, but it has zero markers, okay? So when I say go, you're gonna count how many markers I put in here. Okay, so I'm gonna put the timer now. Okay, we're gonna get started in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. That one, that one was alive. All right, so. Let's count actually, because I didn't keep track of that. So I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight markers that I was able to put in here in this container. So if you have eight, then you did a, you, know, you were able to capture those uh, full eight markers going in there. So uh, that's basically permanent product for you because. That's what we can count. We can count how many things actually were placed in certain locations. Uh, we use this a lot with worksheets, like how many problems did the you know client complete in his or her worksheet? Uh, how many you know? I had a client uh, a few years back where the client would rip his shirts, so I would go into the 
uh, speak with the supervisor. The supervisor would have a box with shirts, and we literally would count how many shirts the client had ripped uh, across the entire week. So these are just examples, once again, of permanent product because they truly matter. They can have an impact on whether the client's making progress or the behavior itself is just not, you know, progress in the way we would like to see. So now we're going to get into uh, one of the final topics here, which is graphing data. Um, I think we did review briefly how you know line graphs look, but in our field we use something called line graphs. You see this right here, the line graphs. Uh, very, very, very much relevant to 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 you know what our um, supervisors, the way our supervisors analyze data. Um, and here, basically, the the dimension that we're looking at is frequency of disruptions. So you see that it goes from zero to eight. And we have something called the baseline phase, which is basically when before we start introducing any type of intervention, uh, the behavior is occurring. You know, on this one right here, it occurs seven times. This one occurs six times. And this one, it happens seven times. Okay, and you're able to track, you know, the days here. So, for instance, you know, here in, in day one, it happens seven times. And day two, it happens six times. And day three, it happens seven times. And that's how your supervisor are going to be basically be tracking the data that you collect for them. They're going to be looking at this. They're going to say, oh, okay, so on, on day one, we had seven, seven instances of disruption. On day two, we had six. And day three, we had seven. So this is our baseline phase. And then they're going to start treatment. They're going to say, look, uh, we would like for you to you know, provide praise when he does, he or she does a not engage in disruption. So if that's the case here, you see that in this behavior on day uh, four, there's response reduced to four. Uh, then it went to five. And then it went to four. Then it went to three. Three, um, this is four, 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 jumped up a little bit to five. Um, let's see, so still four, and then one up to five. But nonetheless, you see a little reduction there, you know, for the behavior kind of uh, plateaued here. Uh, but that's basically how we analyze data. So we basically look at the baseline, and here the treatment was, was very simple, but nonetheless, it was it proved to be you know a little effective in regards to reducing some of the disruptive behavior there. Okay. And where I see this right here, these notes. Go back to the pointer. So uh, basically, you know, uh, when we you know a good way to to get some practice going is that I'm I hope to be able to give you guys a uh, you know an example here. So I'm gonna draw a line graph like this. Okay. So if you can draw a line graph like this in your you know your piece of paper you may have. And I want you to uh, write up to, um, we're going to put one, two, three, and we're going to do four here. And we're going to have, we have one, two, three, four dates. So we're going to do four, uh, four lines here at the bottom. Okay. So on day one, uh, which is here, this is his first uh, data point. This is uh, our first, this is day one data. You see that two tantrums occurred. Okay, so it was two. So what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna put a little dot on the two, okay, for day one. For day two, the data is here. Okay, so this is day two. In this situation, the behavior occurred three times. So you're gonna put it here, okay? So this is day two. Uh, day three, we had two tantrums, okay? So in that situation, you're gonna put it here, okay? Uh, so three. And then last, the last data point we have is three instances. So you're gonna put it here. So, and then what we do afterwards, we basically just connect the dots. Yes, that's simple. We just connect the dots. Uh, that's not a good connection. We connect the dots here like this and like this. Okay, and now right there, you just created your first uh, line graph. And at the bottom here, I would just maybe put, you know, days like what we saw earlier or sessions, you know, and here it would just, you know, here we would put tantrums. Okay, so I'm not gonna... tantrums, you get the idea. So tantrums would be the behavior we're tracking here. So you would put the behavior tracking here, and this will be basically the days of your, your observations. Okay, so I hope that makes sense for you. All right, let's, let's, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and then we can also use bar graphs. Bar graphs are, is something that some of our supervisors may use. Um, here, basically, we have free plays, and this is percentage of intervals. So we see that the, you know, the percentage for this particular behavior in the free play, um, you know, is it's, uh, it's very appropriate, which you see here that the different dimensions, appropriate, off task, or inappropriate. I'm sorry, the image is not, not very clear. 
So the individual here, when they're actually engaging in, uh, in free play, they have to demonstrate higher levels of appropriate behavior. Um, and then, you know, when they're actually in the escape, when they present them instructions, they engage in a lot of inappropriate behaviors. You see this here. So this kind of bar, bar graphs allow us to see these differences. Uh, you see, it's very, very clear here. You see that? So um, it's very good for us to be able to analyze, right? Because then we can see in which conditions the behavior is occurring the most. So as you can see, the prom behavior uh, is the behavior, the maladaptive behavior is occurring the most in the escape condition because they proved it twice. And for us, that's also very important. In our field, we talk about replications. Um, and during free play, we had the same results here uh, in the first one and also in the last one, which once again replicates and proves that this particular uh, behavior is less likely to occur in the, in the free play. Okay, so bar graphs are also help. Okay. All right, let's go back to the pointer. So um, here, basically, we're going to be doing some really simple bar graph. Uh, we're going to practice uh, doing a quick little bar graph for, for ourselves. Um, you know, we're going to be basically, let's see, we go up to 12. So we might want to go by threes. So three, uh, six, nine, 12. and lastly, 12. So you're going to put the numbers like that. So if you, can, if you have a piece of paper with you, go ahead and do this right here. Do your line graph and write your numbers like this. And we're going to have one, two, three, four, four conditions. So we're going to be doing four little lines here. Okay. And the first one's going to be attention. Okay. So for attention, I'm just going to abbreviate it attention. Okay. That's ATT, by the way, not ATT. Um, so here we're going to put it up to here. So this first bar graph goes here. Okay. And then for escape, this is the next one, the next condition. ES. C is going to go all the way up to 12. Okay. And then for tangible, the tangible, it's going to be eight. So it's going to be somewhere around here. Okay. And then sensory, sensory, and it's going to go up to around here. A little bit more than. Okay, and I also like to put sometimes a number there at the top, you know, the, when you use uh, bar, uh, the line um, Excel, it allows you to do that. So you can kind of see the differences. Okay, and here it's uh, nine. So basically, you you know, if I was asked a question, you know, which which condition is the behavior occurring the most, you're going to see that it's the winner is escape. So the client, once again, is engaging in most escape maintain behavior. So that's why the 12 is the highest. Okay. All right, hope this makes sense for you guys. All right, let's move on to the next thing. Um, so basically when we look at baselines, uh, people ask me and, and you know, aside from you know, have, uh, working at ICMB, I'm also an instructor and I always ask, I always ask a question, you know, uh, for baseline, which is basically pre-intervention. I wanna put pre-intervention. So baseline is what happens before you start intervening, before you start doing anything at all, you track, you get a few data points uh, before you start introducing right that uh, that um, intervention, so the most important thing to look for for a baseline is stability. Okay, this right here, this right here is what we want, and this is the thing that's going to make you know us happy. Okay, and this right here, the variability is not going to make us happy. When you're looking at a baseline, uh, you want to ensure that you have uh, as much stability as, as as possible and less the least amount of variability. Okay. These right here, descending um, and ascending, they also don't, don't help very much, okay? Uh, because you're, there's some type of movement already. Uh, so I'm gonna, that's a sad face, by the way, sad face. So these right here, the, the, the number one, we have one, two, three, four. Only number one's the one that makes us happy because that's basically the stability that we're looking for before we start introducing intervention, okay? Because if you start introducing an intervention for already when something's improving or ascending, are you really going to be able to give it validity that it is intervention that has improvement, has improved the behavior when it was already going up? And the answer is no. The same thing when it's descending. So if you want to introduce a, a behavior reduction intervention and the behavior is already going down, it makes no sense for us to, to, to attribute that the reason why that descent was due to that intervention when that, or, that descent was already happening. And variability is all over the place. So we have to first clean up the, the, the that variability before we start introducing an intervention because it's not going to help very much when you have that amount of variability. Okay, so moving on to the next thing here, uh, analyzing data. So 
some of the things we look for when we're analyzing data is we look at trends, uh, we look at levels, and we look at, once again, variability and stability. So here are the trends. So uh, in trends, we're basically seeing whether the behavior is, once again, going up, so in that direction, you really see a little arrow there, or going down, okay? And sometimes we have no trends. So it's basically flat line there in the middle. And this type of, you know, uh, trend really depends, the, the type of trend we want to look for, it really depends on the kind of behavior we're dealing with, right? So if we want to improve behavior, then obviously this will be here, right? This is the kind of trend we would like to see. So I'm going to put here, improve, okay? If we want to reduce, right? Uh, we want to reduce, uh, you know, there's already tantrums happening, there's screaming behaviors, then this is the kind of trend we want to see on our graphs, okay? And if we want to just literally just have something, you know, just have no kind of movement and we're happy just where we're at, then this is good. Um, and usually when we have this kind of trend, we want to see it here, actually, at the bottom, if it's for maladaptive behaviors, right? So for behaviors that are not, that we're not, that, that are, that are problematic, and if it's for really good positive behaviors that are that are really positive for the client, we want to see it here at the top, so in the hundred uh, close to hundred range, okay? So that's where these trends are really important, okay? So it's good for you guys as RBTs and for behavior technicians to get a good idea as to how we analyze data, and that's really the trends are really important for us. And then the levels, levels are also really helpful. The levels, you know, we have high levels, which you see here, boom, at the top near the hundreds. We have moderate levels of responding, and then we have low levels of responding. And when we're analyzing data, when we're writing those reports, we look at this data and we actually, uh, you know, say, look, you know, this response here is occurring at high levels. Uh, this, you know, particular response is occurring at moderate levels, or this is occurring at low levels. So that helps us kind of like talk to our funding sources, and you know, we also have clinicians it allows us to communicate with them. Uh, sometimes families are also really uh, interested in seeing how well their, their their child is doing. So. You can be able to show them right this information by talking a little bit about the levels of, of responding. And once again, going here back to the back to the stability. Once again, if, if it's behavior that we want to see here at the top, that's good stability. That's good. Jane is doing phenomenal. Uh, for Matt, we do see a little quite some variability, and the variability can be a good indicator. It's a flag, a red flag that your supervisor needs to probably go in there, assess whether maybe it's data collection that might be all over the place. Maybe it's the fact that we have some implementation uh, that's not consistent with, with what we had recommended in the, uh, in the beginning. So we may have some uh, treatment drift. Uh, so these two behaviors like this, um, you know, once again, these are things that we need to look for before we start saying, you know, we start basically attributing just specifically to the graph. Also, sometimes what happens is that, you know, you might be not really uh, capturing the true aspect of what's going on with regards to the problem behaviors. So you may have problem behaviors that are probably reinforced by other functions not just one function in that, you know, the client's getting reinforcement from other sources. Sometimes what happens is you have, for instance, behavior technician one uh, that has this kind of responding and you have, um, you know, behavior technician two. So you may have two behavior technicians working on a client and you see that uh, the child responds, you know, a lot higher to a, uh, one particular uh, behavior technician than the other. So that may also occur and that's where your supervisor is going to be looking at these variables in order to assess, in order to try to get us here, which is basically the stability that we always try to look for. Okay, all right, moving on to the next thing. Um, and then basically the progress versus no progress. So uh, we talked about the fact that when we have a baseline, we wanna have that stability here, right? You know, we have, you know, we agree accomplish that stability. Now we can start the treatment here. And when we do this particular type of, you know, um, layout, we try to like figure out whether we can be able to reduce that behavior right away. And you see that, you know, with this implementation, your extinction procedure, which is basically, you know, the ignoring or the, um, following through with instruction, you see that the client did get, you know, did increase the behavior, that there was an increase in behavior um, at some point, which is called extinction burst. But afterwards, you know, the behavior reduced pretty significantly, right? And this is the beauty of, of, of this, right? The fact that you see how quickly the behavior was able to improve in a few sessions, right? Uh, but a graph, once again, is able to show us and tell us that story. And that's what it is. We're telling a story here. We're trying to show that the progress is there. And as a field, once again, we're so empirically validated, we're so data-driven, that we are basing our, our, our overall impressions and results on this here. Okay. Oops, I pressed the wrong one there. Let's go back to, uh, to the pointer here. Um, and then once again, another thing to look for is the fact that, you know, sometimes when we start working on, you know, behaviors, um, you know, we do try to go for the replication aspect of it. So once again, we may have a baseline here, 
and we cause condition A. We introduce a, an intervention in condition B and we see a reduction in behavior. And sometimes uh, it's, this happens more with research uh, area of, of behavior analysis. Uh, the researcher might be, might be curious to see whether when you remove the, the, the intervention, will the behavior also increase again back to the way it was in condition A. And if we have this kind of replication, this kind of jump uh, back to that first or the previous um, you know, condition, then that's a good, that's a sign that this particular intervention is very strong, right? And especially if you're able to now do another line and then go back to the same levels that we have it here. Okay, then we have a very, very good uh, intervention that's very, very solid and it's confirmed through, through the result that it's working well. All right, so that basically does it. Uh, I hope that you were able to find some information that was relevant to measurement. Uh, do not stress too much about you know measurement. I, I, I really want you guys to focus obviously more on the element of being able to practice the whole aspect of you know uh, working with the clients and everything. Measurement is critical though. I, I hope that you guys were able to get that information. And at least now you get a better sense of how you know, data collection helps us make decisions, right? And at the end of the day, that's gonna, you're going to be a really, really, uh, you know, critical part of that particular process. All right. So once again, this is Dr. Davila. I hope you have a good one. Take care.